The journey of Paradigm Initiative started small. It was curved out of the deep desire to ensure no young person is denied the opportunity to use a computer. Fifteen years later, Paradigm Initiative continues to impact the lives of African youth with improved livelihoods through digital opportunities and protection of their online rights. From a single cyber cafe in the Ajegunle area of Lagos, Paradigm Initiative has empowered youth with the skills they need to create careers for themselves. By teaching young people who had never had access to a computer skills that would open the world to them, the organization created a movement that would transform thousands of lives across Nigeria and Africa. This was made possible with a small dedicated team, most of them being volunteers. The small team of volunteers have grown to become a rotating team of dedicated full-time staff all focused on transforming the lives of young people across Africa. The organization has spread its wings across Africa and currently has presence in Nigeria, Kenya, Senegal, Cameroon, Democratic Republic of Congo, Zambia and Zimbabwe. We started in 2007 and the idea was very simple. The idea was to connect young people who would otherwise not have the opportunities with training. Of course, we knew tech and we know tech, so tech was the obvious platform of choice. And so the idea was to train them so they could have a better chance at either getting a job or generally improving their lives. And I think we've done, uh, you know, quite some of that to date. We started from a, you know, small cyber cafe in Ajegunle. And the choice of Ajegunle was was pretty simple for me because I was invited to many places across, you know, across Nigeria and even beyond to train young people on how to use computers. But in Nigeria, it was special. It wasn't just about how to use computers. It was about how to use computers to improve their lives so they can afford to, you know, uh, pay their own school fees, have your younger brother or younger sister also go to school. So it was, it was kind of unique. Uh, the experience of training there. I've had a long engagement with the initiative that is in. Many years ago, I was walking up the stairwell at the Lagos Business School, and one of the young participants walked across to me and introduced himself. Uh, name? Binga Cheson. And that started a conversation that has I've gone on for more than the 15 years that PIN has uh, been in existence. I'd um, say that probably one of the few people that was there when it started. And that is because I knew being there before he even started um, Paradigm Initiative. It was a vision of a young man who then was on stage in Africa, leading youth into the digital space. And that vision started and people like I, along the way, were in a position to support the realization of that dream. I knew the executive director when PIN was only a, an idea. Uh, and I saw the grit and the passion with which he's built this organization um, and seen how it's grown progressively. I remember in 2005, uh, the executive director currently was the only full-time staff member of PIN. I remember the very first time I got involved in PIN. It was because someone introduced me to the present ED, called the ED, Benga Sheson. And how the person introduced me to Benga Sheson was that he said, here's this young guy who has spoken at the UN, right, on behalf of youth. And I was like, oh, this is very interesting. We got talking and um, we did a couple of things together. And then out of the blue one day, he just said to me, Dr. Shea, I would like you to be a member of the board. At that time, I think there were about six of us. Uh, I know Fela was on the board then and a number of other people. I was one of the pioneer volunteers at Paradigm Initiative um, for the pilot project, PIN pilot project that was known then as ajigunle.org. So um, this happened during my service here in NYSC, 2007 into 2008. 
um, for community development, I was looking for you know a project or a program that was impactful, not just something to sign monthly, you know, and be on my way. And um, as fortune would have it, on one of the days when I was at the Secretariat, um, the founding members of Infotech Core, Information Technology Core, came to speak to the coppers. And one of them was Benga Shison, who is the founder of Paradigm Initiative. So when he told the story of um, the founding of Infotech Core, it's aligned with me because that was a dream I've had since I was a teenager. Youth development, especially in Africa and especially in Nigeria. So immediately I was interested and I signed up for Infotech Core. Um, and during my time with Infotech Core, I met another team member who was also the first program manager at Paradigm Initiative. His name is Ugo Musu. And he told me about the project they were starting and that they needed volunteers. I was like, sign me up. This is my dream. This is what I want to do. When I joined the initiative, one thing that amazed me was uh, the work that um, the team was already doing across Africa, especially in Senegal, a, a French-speaking country, seeing a young Nigerian Tr uh, trying to fill the gap, trying to help all the young Africans to learn more on digital communication, on, on technology, was amazing. Uh, I still recall going with the then British Deputy High Commissioner, Bob DeWar, and um, the um, Trade and Investment uh, uh, Director of the British Deputy High Commission, Peter Stevenson into a Jigunle uh, for a ceremony to graduate the first, very first set of people who went through the program and the famous uh, class that were then interns with the British Deputy High Commission. The most profound and impactful thing that the organization has done is the training and the testimonials that we are getting from those who have benefited from the training and what they have been able to do with their lives as a result of the training. I think that's, that is perhaps one of the biggest contributions that the organization has made to mankind. One thing that really stands out for me, you know, in terms of Pin's journey is people can see all the great stuff that's happening now, can see the trajectory of growth. But I have to hand it to the initial people that ran PIN. I remember when PIN's office was in two places. The first place was somewhere in Ajigule. Not even before they built the Ajigule office, right? But when it was, an, it was a, the training held in the, in the local government of, uh, of Ajigule, right? And they would give a small space for PIN to come in and, and speak. And the second place that PIN ran out of was uh, Benga Shesson's home at the time which I think was somewhere in Unikma, right? So I've kind of seen the tenacity, I've seen the focus, I've seen the integrity that, um, that the Benga has brought to, to, to all that PIN is doing. And uh, I remember at the time, uh, the very, I think the very, one of the very first events I went for was an event at a Jigule, right? And um, you know, what stood out for me, and that's a story I'll never forget, was a story of a guy in a Jigule I think it was a young man or a young lady, I can't quite remember, who at the time had gotten a job with the British High Commission. That person had started PIN, finished PIN's program, and then based on what I think she had learned, yes, I believe it was a female, uh, she went for an interview at British High Commission and was now working at British High Commission in, I'm not sure if it was the visa section, but I remember at the time we kept saying to ourselves, this is amazing, it's amazing what, you can do or what can happen if people have the right right opportunity so that's just one of you know very many stories that that to me are an example of what pain can do and what pain is really all about you know giving opportunity to young people when we started in 2007 uh, some of the first few people who understood what we were doing even before we decided to even talk to anyone about it uh, you know there's, there's a gentleman called praise for Owe who had started doing some work in Ajegule. Uh, it was called, you know, it was a community program uh, and it was basically mentoring young people. And we 
you know, were able to get to work with him. Uh, he was the one who provided the first, you know, uh, opportunity for us to interact with young people who he had been training for us to train them uh, the first set of uh, materials literally if we can put it that way of raw materials uh, came from the uncommon man network uh, which Prince Owe uh, was running and as we continued to run the training there were you know a lot of people who came around uh, to support the work uh, you know, uh, I remember one of the first visitors we had was uh, Nia Desanya, who came around to talk to the kids. Uh, of course, he was known as a motivational speaker, but beyond that, it was great that he was able to share his personal story, you know, challenges in education and how he overcame that and, and of course, became an institution uh, himself. Then we had institutions like DHL. DHL was the first company after the UK Deputy High Commission uh, that hosted an intern from our training. Uh, we had Lona Med Africa uh, and of course the British Deputy High Commission uh, through Peter Stevenson who and of course Moji, uh, Moji was the major force uh, behind you know this interesting idea uh, of the UKTI visiting us. So we had the Deputy High Commissioner uh, and members of the team uh, of the UK Trade and Investment Unit coming to Ajegunle to visit us. And it was, it was a landmark event because what that did for the kids was that it introduced them to not just the world they were in, in Nigeria, uh, but to this new diplomatic community uh, that was willing to engage with them. And we got two internships uh, at the UKTI. Paradigm Initiative Nigeria was born at a time when Nigeria's internet image was steadily declining. The youths were disenfranchised the older generation subscribed to the tried and true formula of getting a higher education and getting a job. There were few jobs. The future seemed bleak for most of them. Most young people had never even seen a computer and wouldn't know what to do with one if they even came across one. For a number of young people, their experience was life-changing. At their fingertips, was access to a world of information to build skill sets that would slowly but surely change the very communities around them. Paradigm Initiative created a network of centers designed to penetrate the often overlooked parts of the country where access to current technology was almost non-existent. There are different projects that, uh, that we run that through those projects are uh, what allows us to to continue to lead a gap that exists among young people, especially in those and self communities, and as well uh, projects that we want that, add, that helps us to address the issues around uh, digital rights in the ecosystem. So I remember attending several, participating in some um, recruitment process for new students into the uh, LIFE program, what we call LIFE program, then the digital inclusion program in Najegunle in, in, and then in in Abba, and many of these young people, they had never, you know, touched a, co a computer before. And I'm not talking about 1980s, I'm talking about 2017, 2018, when you assume that any, everybody at that age, you know, 16, 17 year old, they should have been using computer, but they never had access to it because in their school, it was not existing. At home, their parents couldn't afford it. So they will have missed out on getting that skills. And I believe the parent was able to get as many kids as possible into the space, into getting them to think about how they can leverage these tools, you know, to create value, to create wealth for themselves. The training paradigm initiative from the entrepreneurship training to the ICT skill. So a lot I do around helping my business drive graphics, drive websites, designs, do a number of things is a very strong involvement of what the training program did for me. So through the train, I had the opportunity of working with UK Trade and Investments. The program is a life legacy program and it's in partnership with Ajikile Business School, which I'm actually partaking with right now. Me seeing myself as an average guy who knows about designs, graphic designs. Coming here, I felt like oh, I could build up, but I felt the knowledge I had wasn't stable. But this program enlightened me and brought me up from the former level I was to a greater height, which I was still be putting more pressure and improving. 
before I joined the Life Legacy program, I was a novice. Like, I didn't know anything about computer. I was basically a computer illiterate. But starting the program, it has been mind-blowing, mind-shifting, thought-provoking, the entrepreneurship programs as well. It's already giving my business a different look already because I'm already applying it in the aspect of advertising. Um, my target audience, before now, I didn't know anything about that. I was just posting and... To my surprise, I wasn't getting as much clients as I wanted, but applying what I've learned here on our Thursday classes, it has really been helpful to my business. It has impacted me in the aspect of me not having an idea of handling my business, although I run a mini online store, but the entrepreneurship classes we have has boosted me, has motivated me, making me know the do's and don'ts. And Applying me applying it to my life and my business, I feel that by the end of this program, I should be outstanding. The uh, program I actually learned recently is the one of um, the coral drill where I have to make my brand look really nice and catchy, kind of. So for my fashion brand, I know I have to make a name for myself, and through this skill I've learned, I'll be able to make it catchy and to draw people to myself. I learned about the P program from my elder brother. He is also an alumni of P, and through him, he actually forced me <laughs> to come to the program. And that class was um, 2013 Class D. I learned coding from Padam Initiative, and it has done a lot in my life because initially I was only doing the computer engineering aspect. But now I've also included coding to it. And I've trained some couple of students and I've made a lot of money from it. Over the weeks, we've been learning about programming languages, the likes of JavaScript, markup languages like the HTML, and um, PowerPoint presentations. We actually had a competition on that, and it was quite mind-blowing. I must say it was a highlight of the program for me. And also, even the uh, facilitators that came around they were impactful because their lives and what they've learned that they passed through us was really, really impactful in confidence. And because the way I speak with the with clients and the way I think, it's really, really just changed when I came to PIN via the entrepreneurship class. I have one student that created a website that the company is using right, right now. And I have another student that created, he created this e-commerce website and it's currently functioning and is making lots of money. One of the um, programs we took interest in is the coding program. So after learning how to code, we're able to work for an um, organization like WTEC. We currently work for them as facilitators where we teach other people how to code. I benefited from both the ICT skills and also the entrepreneurship skills. I have my own fashion business and I'm also a software developer. I actually learned about PI from school. They came to our school to do um, a, a three-day program for girls. So after the three-day program, they told us that there was another program for like 10 weeks and that after school, we, we can apply. And that was how I applied for it. Well, for the ICT skills, um, a web developer, a, soft, a software developer also. I currently facilitate young kids in the ICT sector. And for my fashion brand, I make clothes, I sell clothes, which I post online and have a great audience. I am a back-end developer and I first wrote my first line of code in Paradigm Initiative. Although I'm not an entrepreneur, but I have knowledge on entrepreneurship skills because we're giving the life skills that have helped me work with people. I learned most of it, not in school, but in Paradigm Initiative. What I've learned so far from the Paradigm Initiative program is um, that as a young person, we should try as much as possible to open our minds to learn new things and undermining whatever the thing is. And we should not just be stuck in one comfort zone. We should try as much as possible to go out there, meet people, and try to do new things, open our minds to new things. The program has impacted my life really well. And um, I remember um, wanting to um, study elect, elect, and um, just get a good job you know and i'm um, just but currently i uh, am more because um 
I do trainings for people in terms of software development. I see a, a bigger me. The life program was like a life changer for me because when before I went into the program, I was just like every other normal Ajegule girl. During live, I was working in a secondary school and they were pay, I was teaching two subjects. They were paying me 15000 until I got a form and then I learned some life skills and then some soft skills too. And I, I remember one of those days when we were in class and one of the teachers said we should write out what we would love to be in the next five years. One of the things I wrote were I was going to be a model manager and a coach and I was going to have made my short film in five years and when i did a, a, a breakdown of everything that i've accomplished after that year i've done my short film and i've opened a model agency and i've closed it and i've moved on to making movies this is the interesting way we've seen things evolve because of our partners uh then we you know came in touch with companies like microsoft uh, that gave us our first uh, big grant uh, for establishing our office in Ajegunle for setting up a computer center where each student, we had a class of 20 students and each of them had a computer to themselves. Uh, my promise uh, at the beginning from 2007 was that I'm never going to run a program where students will, you know, over around a computer, five students, one laptop. They don't learn anything, but we wanted each child to come into the room, sit in an air-conditioned room. Yes, it's a jigunle. Yes, when you go outside, you begin to hear noise and things like that. But once you came into our, you know, into our office, into our training center, you came into a different world where you could see the future, where you could see uh, what was possible. In 2013, we became partners with Internews. Internews is a DC-based uh, non-profit, uh, and they've been around for a very long time. Internews and Eldhorse, you know, they literally gave us templates of documents that they, you know, that they created many years ago. That's interesting, you know, that's what we now do with many of the institutions we work with across the African continent. They gave us templates, financial policies, uh, audit policies, you know, templates of documents, HR policies that we were able to contextualize and begin to use it as an organization. And then, you know, uh, we got, you know, support from a lot of institutions like the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, they gave us our first big, 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 big uh, multi-year uh, grant, which really helped us expand our work beyond Lagos uh, into other locations. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we met partners like the Ford Foundation, like the Netherlands Embassy, uh, like the U.S. government, and, of course, uh, a few other partners who we now work with, uh, Open Society Foundations, and not just because they give us money, but also because they understood the work we were doing even before we got to them. Uh, so they understood the sector, they knew what we were doing in digital inclusion and digital rights. So when we presented our work to them, it was then much easier uh, for us to be able to have a conversation about how do you support our work, how does the work go forward, uh, and how do we, you know, are we able to do that? I mean, people like uh, Omidia Network and Luminate, whose you know, support for our work were sort of focused on a specific area, uh, or ISOC Foundation or others. And the reason why that could happen was because they understand that even though what we're, what we're doing at the time wasn't quite popular. When we started working in digital rights uh, in 2013, it wasn't something that you know, was a big deal. In fact, at the time, it was supposed to be a foreign idea. Uh, but, but they understood the need to begin to do the work in Nigeria uh, in advance of what we have now seen. I mean, COVID literally uh, was the proof that we were looking for all the while to show to people that digital is mainstream. Digital isn't, you know, second fiddle. If you don't have digital access and there's a lockdown, you can't go to school, you can't talk to family, you can't go to work, you can't do anything, literally. After two years when I joined, uh, we were able to expand our operations into, into, the, into the southeast, somewhere in uh, Abia State, in Aba. Uh, two years after then again, we were able to go into the north, uh, northwest, somewhere in Kanu and uh, the community in Takata. Yeah, so when I say, when, we, when I talk about the life project, life project has, you know, it, it, takes, it takes the model that works to evolve. Me and WTEC have worked together in um, a lot of programs, several programs. Presently, we are collaborating with um, Payne on um, our WTEC Academy project, After School Clubs for Girls, as well as um, the Makerspace project. I started by noticing a gap. I saw that the people in our community are entrepreneurial in nature. They want to do something enterprising, but they don't have the required and relevant knowledge. So I started at Jugular Business School to fill that knowledge gap. 
uh, to help people to acquire the entrepreneurial skill and to help them build network that will form collaboration for them to do business in a proper way. My organization, our Juggler Business School, we just started a relationship with Paradigm Initiative this year. So we just did an MOU to be an implementing partner of the Life Legacy Program. We have um, worked together in um, training girls in um, STEM skills and um, also opening opportunities for girls, underserved girls and um, boys in the community. I started work with Paradigm Initiative in the digital inclusion part of our work. And over these eight years, I have, um, while implementing the digital inclusion programs, I've been involved in the life program, I've been involved in the digital jobs program, I've been involved in Intel She Will Connect program, and I have been also involved in the, taking our programs into secondary schools, which we are calling the life um, a school program. And we have also moved our Intel She Will Connect program into what we now call digital readiness workshops. Among all these programs, I will say that the life training, the life at school, the, and the Intel She Will Connect programs have been the most impactful for me because in the course of implementing these programs, we've been able to impact over 1,500 youths in ABBA and environs. So, and not just that only, it has also given me the opportunity to take what we are doing into other states in the Southeast and the South South region of Nigeria. And I work as the Programs Partnership and Engagement Officer at Paradigm Initiative. I am also the Northern Nigeria Regional Lead. I work from our Kano office, Kano, Nigeria. We have a live program in Kano where we train youths from underserved communities on um, ICT entrepreneurship and capacity building. We've set our mark. If you step out now and you mention PIN, I'm sure from every household on this um, on these streets, there has been someone who has benefited from uh, the PIN uh, life training. And we also, we've also gone into schools around this area, around Dakata. We've taken our life program out of the center to schools. We've trained um, youths from schools. And we also hold uh, a digital readiness workshop for girls. To me, that's, the, that's my personal um, what would I say? I'll put it like that is my own personal because when you see those girls, those young girls come in here, some of them have never touched a computer in their lives. So when they come in here, we pick them from schools, get girls as young as 12, they come in here, they touch the computer, they put it on, they type and they see just to give them a taste of what technology can do. And from there, they pick up interest and before you know it, it's, uh, they want to go into ICT. I work as Senior Manager Grants and Strategy at Paradigm Initiative. Um, I've been in Paradigm Initiative for slightly over eight years. I joined the organization in July 2014. I've been in many roles within the, the, the organization. I mean, we started off just providing trainings. So people come, they get trained, they go. Then at some point, we added an, a component to it whereby you don't just get trained, you also get exposed to opportunities. So there are people who came for the training who we then were able to get on placements in some very big organizations such as Intel. I think uh, the British Commission, uh, I Commission was also a partner at some point. So there have been people who came through the training and after the training, they were able to work sometimes in internship capacity just to expose them to the workspace. Uh, but then after a while, we then expanded the training to become a 360 degree approach, whereby we, well, that was when we introduced what we now call the life training. Life means life, uh, ICT, financial literacy and entrepreneurship skill. In terms of operations, um, I, think, I think the team understands that every project, regardless of size or, and every program is equally important because, um, for example, with the LIFE program, we are still measuring impact from the first ever LIFE pr um, program session. Today, we still get feedback about um, the impact. So you can't really say one is more impactful than the other. In terms of our work, they work hand in hand. Our programs work hand in hand. Um, you can't have one without the other. You cannot have digital inclusion without talking about um, digital rights. Um, so in terms of impacts, I would say, for example, as well, 
we can have a very small but well-planned and executed stakeholder manage, um, event or engagement, and that would lead to positive change in legislation or policy. We've seen that happen. There was another fight looming in the horizon. With access to the internet getting easier by the day and the African youth finding more and more opportunities to better their futures, their rights had to be protected. Paradigm Initiative stepped once more into the forefront. This time, the fight was to keep the internet a safe and open place for the young African to express themselves without fear of repercussion and restraint. From engaging stakeholders to create policies that would affect digital rights in Africa, to initiating litigation against governments for abusing digital rights, Paradigm Initiative has a focus on keeping the internet a safe place for the youths of Africa. In terms of um, contributing to advancements in the digital ecosystem, I would say Paradigm Initiative has, has been instrumental in increasing mindshare of digital rights and digital inclusion issues in Africa um, through some of our projects like LONDA, which is a digital rights and inclusion in Africa annual report. Um, through our fellowships, we have a media fellowship where we're very specific about building capacity of mid-career journalists to be able to report on digital rights issues because we see that that is constantly overlooked when it shouldn't be because we're in the digital age so it should be more important um, with drill with our digital rights academies and workshops so I, I, I would say one of our most positive contributions is increasing mindshare um, about digital rights and inclusion issues not just in Nigeria but across the continent. The digital rights program is um, essentially an advocacy program. The idea, I'm going to break it down, is we want to ensure that Nigeria and other African countries have laws and practices that favor human rights in the internet space. So um, think about the current, the, um, the last Twitter ban, something like that. So basically we are advocating that governments around Africa create laws and policies and regulations that are rights respecting and also act in rights respecting ways um, to digital citizens. So for example, when there was that big issue about uh, the National Assembly doing a gag on the social media space, um, the uh, Paradigm Initiative was in the forefront to ensure that that didn't happen, that the space remains open and free and fair. And we've seen that digital um, program initiative did also that across other countries in Africa, where sometimes you find that during an election period, when, so for example, put a, sh shut down the internet or stop Facebook or ban Twitter, we've seen that when such things happen in countries in Africa, Paradigm Initiative steps in. When um, internet abuse became a, an important th um, thing to focus on, because we had these young people who are uh, being misguided, we are abusing the internet. I was very, very uh, quick to support the initiative on um, inter internet integrity. And um, PIN organized a program um, at the Sheraton in Lagos to um, draw attention to problems of uh, dignity on the internet. And um, I think many of the people, the early sponsors that uh, being turned to, did not believe him that I would come to the event. And so everybody was skeptical. And so when I showed up, uh, you know, the um, atmosphere kind of changed. And I wondered, why, why not? Because that is really the essence of our humanity. Before Paradigm Initiative, there was no positive rights le legislation for digital rights in like Africa. And we introduced that. And although it's still in the works, but just the impact of having the Senate and the House of Reps listen, discuss, um, think about passing such a law. In fact, pass it. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't assented to by the 
precedent, um, but like just the impact of just penetrating that space with such a remarkable legislation. Other impacts included things like lit um, um, litigation, right? It was very interesting because when we first started, the governments were, it's not like a joke, right? The judiciary were not used to seeing cases of like NGOs come to court and say, the government shouldn't have done this. And it was an issue as simple as um, human rights online. They're like, please mind your business. But the more we took cases to court, the more the judiciary began to realize that, oh, there, there are human rights and they can be applied online as well. So there's the right to privacy online. There's the right to freedom of expression online and things like that. And in the long run, what that has done for Nigeria and other countries that we've worked in is that it has helped the government to know that they are accountable, not just for um, things that they are generally always accountable for or light and stuff, but even for rights that are basic like digital rights. The impact has been amazing. Also, we have trained, um, we trained lawyers, we trained journalists. It's just like, it, it's just a beautiful program because it, it's very multi-stakeholder-ish. Uh, it takes all the different um, stakeholders in the space and it just impacts them. Uh, let me also mention that beyond Nigeria, the objective of Digital Rights and Freedom Day is now effectively being promoted in about four or five Af other African countries. This year alone, we've been in Gambia, we've, I mean, we've been in Zambia, we've been in Malawi, we've been in uh, Tanzania, uh, we, we're going to be in DRC Congo in, in some weeks, you know. And one thing we've been doing there is meeting with parliamentarians, meeting with their legislators, trying to uh, work with them to pass digital rights legislation in their respective countries. That is huge uh, because that is direct impact in policy processes in those countries. So we've seen how we've been able to not just speak to policy uh, influencers or policy uh, makers in Nigeria alone. We've seen how we've been able to engage with other policy makers in other countries across uh, Nigeria. We've been able to see how uh, the organization has been recognized as one of the top leaders in the ecosystem of what we do. We've been recognized in different uh, conferences around around the continent that has to do with uh, data rights and data inclusion, working with uh, uh, different uh, organizations like Google, the, the likes of Google, the likes of Facebook and all that. So that, that's, 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 those are milestones where you, 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 that tells you that the organization is growing and uh, we've gone beyond where we all started from. I think it's important to also uh, talk about our, you know, governance board and because as we continued to, you know, evolve from an idea that one person started to becoming an institution, it was really important for us to build a team of people that could literally knock me on the head, Benga, no, this is wrong, do the right thing. Uh, we started with, you know, two board members, uh, Professor Pato Tomi and Dr. You know, Adebayo Olubi. Initially when PIN started, I know Benga won't like to hear this, but hey, facts is facts. A lot of what PIN was doing and a lot of the, you know, credibility and awareness that PIN had was because of Benga himself. You know, Benga was very much out there. He had a, a, a very interesting profile. And I think anybody that came across that profile at the time would have felt, oh, you know what, whatever this guy is doing sounds as if I should pay attention. So that was a stage in PIN's, in PIN's existence. But again, this, this has changed and it's because it's been deliberate. You know, uh, Benga and the rest of the board have begun to diversify, bringing more people on the board. I mean, at the time when it was predominantly men, now there's an equal footage, equal percentage of men and women on the board. Uh, so that's been very quite, that's been quite strategic and, and deliberate. Uh, then there has been less emphasis on, on Benga himself. He still plays a very important role, but now we've, the team has expanded. Uh, we've had partners come in, people like Ford Foundation, who have spent time intentionally building the internal capacity of PIN as an organization. So when you look at that change that's happened, you realize that PIN is actually positioned to do even greater things uh, in times past because there is now, um, shall we say, structure, you know, deepening structure, stronger structure. There are systems in place, you know, uh, and even if Binga lives tomorrow or any other major person lives tomorrow, PIN will carry on. With several centers across the nation, Paradigm Initiative evolved into a pan-African organization tasked to repeat their successes in other parts of Africa, Binga Chasson, 
and a small but dedicated team of highly intelligent individuals traveled all over Africa. They created centers to bring truly relevant skill sets to the underserved youths across Africa. With the aid of a number of philanthropic and tech-focused organizations across the world, Paradigm Initiative fought hard to connect the African youth to the rest of the world and give these young people the opportunities they were seldom, if ever, offered. From sometime 2012-2013, uh, myself and other team members started traveling a lot. Uh, you know, we'll get invitations to come to a lot of countries uh, to come and discuss the work we're doing or to, you know, work with other people in other organizations on literally replicating what we're doing. And, you know, there was a lot of, uh, if I may use the word pressure, for us to replicate what we're doing in Nigeria in other countries. And originally, the plan for me was not to set up offices in other countries. Uh, but by the time we got to 2013, 2014, 2015, it was very clear uh, what we started you know, as a forum to bring people from various places together uh, then became a regional event. So by 2016, uh, when I started thinking of actually just having another office uh, in Francophone Africa, because we started doing some work in French-speaking countries. I mean, I didn't understand or speak French uh, at the time. Even now, I don't speak French. I just, you know, because I've associated a lot and worked, I can understand what people are speaking around me. And I thought it was important for us to have someone who was able to lead our work in that region. Coincidentally, uh, and the way this is the way life is, when you're thinking about something, the resources that are going to help you do that, then you begin to identify and, you know, sort of notice them. So what happened was at the time, Google started something called uh, if, you know, Google Policy Fellowship Program, uh, and they gave us a chance to select two people to work with us in the organization in Nigeria. Uh, but then I you know, sent to them and said, listen, uh, we appreciate your offer, but would like to work with these two people outside Nigeria, not in Nigeria. And they said, OK, why not? You know, yes. So we hired someone. We made a general call. One francophone, we were certain, the other from anywhere. Uh, so for the francophone one, we got someone working from Cameroon. Uh, so that explains why we're still in Cameroon. Uh, par uh, toucher, uh, par toucher les cerveaux. Nous avons commencé par un travail de recherche, notamment avec uh, uh, les rapports sur l'état des droits numériques en Afrique. Uh, donc uh, les pays d'Afrique uh, francophone ont été régulièrement cités. Uh, pour des cas d'actualité uh, sur les droits numériques et l'inclusion numérique, uh, nous avons uh, organisé, que ce soit au Cameroun, uh, que ce soit au Sénégal, que ce soit uh, uh, en République démocratique du Congo, que ce soit au Tchad, uh, que ce soit, uh, que ce soit au, en Côte d'Ivoire, des ateliers de sensibilisation, des ateliers de plaidoyer, des ateliers de politique sur la bonne utilisation de l'Internet tout en respectant les droits numériques, mais également comment est-ce que euh, ces pays-là peuvent euh, mieux euh, se bâtir autour de l'inclusion numérique. Mais également, euh, nous avons un programme euh, qui est un forum euh, panafricain qui s'appelle le DRIF, qui s'organise chaque année et autour donc, euh, de ce programme, nous permettons aux leaders de, de chaque pays de se réunir et de discuter des questions sensibles liées aux droits numériques et aux libertés Internet dans leur pays, dans leur cadre. Euh, entre autres, il y a euh, également euh, des rencontres euh, de, de formation, ce que nous appelons les Digital Academy, l'Académie euh, du numérique. Donc nous, nous, nous formons euh, des personnes euh, de haut niveau, des décideurs politiques, sur comment est-ce qu'ils doivent percevoir la question des droits numériques et l'inclusion numérique dans l'ensemble, pour pouvoir sauver l'image de l'Afrique, mais également du monde, en matière du respect des libertés sur Internet, du droit numérique, mais également accroître l'inclusion numérique au niveau du monde. I am the program officer for Francophone West Africa in the Chess office in Senegal. I have been working for Paradigm Initiative for five months now. As a program officer at PIN, some of the most impactful programs I have been part of are the life training and the digital readiness workshop for girls. The life training is very impactful in particular because I get to interact and train young people from the ages of 15 to 28 to guide them through life and prepare them for the professional world. It is a very impactful program because I can see 
the evolution, the changes that happen with them from the first day they start to the 10 weeks when they complete the program. They often come back to me saying that they have really, really, really enjoyed the program. In the life training, we often have youth that do not know what to do. Uh, they might have been to university or they might have been working for some time, but they are not aware of the digital opportunities. However, they do try their best during the program and by the end, they are able, we can see the impact, we can see the competencies that they have gathered. By the end of the program, they are already making posters, earning some money that can allow them to do the, uh, the basic requirements, the basic minimum for themselves and for their families. I work for Paradigm Initiative as a core lead under programs. Um, where my work really involves um, leading on internet freedom advocacy projects. Um, very specific to capacity building and policy. In terms of achievements, Paradigm Initiative has achieved um, a lot in country. Uh, but of course, for me, my proudest moment will always be having to open the Lusaka Zambia office. Um, you know, being the person to lead uh, on Paradigm uh, Initiative's expansion strategy into Southern Africa. So for me, I count that as one of my proudest moments. Uh, but of course, in speaking to other achievements, uh, we've been able to build strong partnerships uh, within Zambia. Um, and we've been able to support our partners technically, uh, some of whom we've seen uh, going on to start their own internet freedom advocacy projects or programs, um, either within their organizations or individually. I think the first lesson we learned is in terms of, you know, uh, wi the willingness to take uh, sort of take the backstage to be, you know, you know, behind the scenes uh, and not take the credit uh, for the work that you do. Because when we started, some of the work that we did were being used by some stakeholders, uh, like say government. So we drafted a bill and gave it to a member of parliament. He submitted it in parliament and he won an international award. And you know, the joke in the office was like, ah, our work is what this guy used to win an award. But we realized that being able to stand back and allow someone else take credit for your work. While short term, it looks like you're losing the opportunity to claim credit. Long term, people know who did the work and other stakeholders can trust you to become a partner. I mean, we've written policy briefs that, you know, government representatives or even businesses have been able to use to have conversations on a topic that we know more than them. Uh, so I think being able to take the back seat uh, and lead from behind is, is something that we've, you know, we've learned uh, and that is very helpful. And, you know, for me also personally, that's, that's something, you know, that I've learned and we've been able to imbibe within the organization. When we're transitioning from a few passionate young people working together to an institution that will be sustainable, one of the first things that I said to the team members, especially the comms guys, was that, you know what, when we send out press statements, when we have to do media stuff, don't put my name and don't put my face. And we all laughed. Ah, why, Jesus? You know, we need your face and name to make this, you know, bigger and things like that. But I said, listen, if we keep putting my name and face, then pain becomes synonymous with Ben Gasheson. And institutions are not synonymous with people. Institutions are powered by people, but they have a bigger might that people can even derive from. And you know, that for us was for me personally an opportunity, to, you know, to sit back. And guess what? I'm sitting back and I'm watching the brilliant young people that we've been able to hire running the race many times better than I would have thought of. And that was very powerful, uh, a powerful lesson for us to learn, you know, being able to lead from behind and get work done. Uh, anyway, you know, the fear that you won't get credit is not really as valid because people know, you know, that, you know, you started this thing or you're involved with this thing and you will get your credit, you will get your credit. One of our biggest achievements as an institution is transparency. Uh, in 2013, when we decided to start publishing our annual audited accounts on our website, it wasn't a requirement. It wasn't because any government agency uh, said we should do it. But we wanted to you know, transparently show that this is how we use the resources. You know, this is how we use what we get. Uh, and that has been very helpful because I think one of the beautiful things about people reaching out to us and say, saying things like, oh, we've heard about you. Uh, we've heard you get a job done and you're transparent. And these two things make us want to work with you. I think that itself is a major, major help in terms of how we've, you know, inched closer to sustainability and, of course, 
uh, when you know you're a more sustainable organization, you have the confidence, you have a runway, uh, you're not worried about raising money to work for the next three months. You're thinking the next three years, the next five years, the next 10 years, the next 50 years. If you're able to think like that, you're able to work better you know, in the short to medium term. So those are some of the big opportunities we've, we've had. I know that the organization is doing work on artificial intelligence. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot more. And that's where the core work of, of PIN is going to be very critical. Because as we move into the fourth industrial revolution and the plethora of um, technologies, issues of digital rights even become much more urgent. The whole question of artificial intelligence, but the other forms of of uh, technologies that 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 are problematic um, and can support society but can also cause a lot of trouble for society so i think that uh pain's work is cut out but it's also very it's a very versatile organization because it has these core principles it works on it can interface with the current technological trend of the day? I see Paradigm Initiative currently it's in six countries. I see it in about the rate at which we're going, at least 15 countries across the continent. But also um, working to ensure that Africa is in the forefront of um, wherever technology would have taken us, issues around um, artificial intelligence, issues around um, all the new things that technology is doing, blockchain, in that space. I, I see Paradigm Initiative leading Africa into that, providing young people um, with the space. And I also see younger people taking over the organization. The, the uh, director, um, Binga, said today that we have seventh generation of Paradigm Initiative team members. In the next five years, I, I see a picker and rapid turnaround. I see that I'm not on the board by then anymore. More people would have come in with newer approaches, newer vision and insight into what we need to do. I think the trajectory for the next five years, 10 years, 15 years is, is very positive. We continue to, as, as an organization, PIN continues to, to focus on the things that, that matter. Uh, at one point, it was opportunities for digital youth. Now it is guaranteeing digital rights for everybody. And who knows what it's going to be uh, in the future. But certainly, uh, it will be relevant, it will be impactful, and we look forward to another 15 years. I see um, a pin which focuses on information as a critical uh, um, player because the easiest way to divide people is to create unequal availability of information. Information asymmetries uh, give advantage uh, to some people over those that don't have the information. And this typically is the reason that um, uh, you have the inequalities that lead to frictures and, um, if you will, sometimes uh, disharmony. Um, I think that as the work of PIN spreads, as a lot of young people begin to get uh, to be digital natives and begin to um, be able to hold power accountable and be able to use um, the tools of the fourth industrial revolution to make society work for everybody. Blockchain technology to check corruption and so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to need more an organization like PIN. And I am looking forward to PIN becoming a major continental uh, player. PIN has spent 15 years. Uh, if PIN was a, if PIN was human, PIN would be a teenager now. Uh, so it means that there were many lessons that we learned over the last 15 years. Uh, number one, we will uh, now as a mature 
uh, institution be able to put all of the lessons we've learned into our work. So we look forward to not just bigger impact, but better relationships with our partners so that we're able to deliver better value for the resources uh, that, that we get. Uh, the other is in terms of our people. You know, and, and, and I'm big on people not because uh, you know, it's something that people are told to do, but because we've seen it, you know, uh, practically, uh, you know, benefits what we do. The, the more excited our people are, the happier they are on the job, uh, the, you know, the more resourced uh, they are in terms of what they have to do, the better we're able to do. And we're so excited about, you know, some of the partners we're talking to in terms of not just supporting our programs, but supporting us as an institution so that we're able to do better. And we invite anyone out there who is interested in either digital rights or digital inclusion for Africa or the entire global south, reach out to us and let's talk. We will give you big bangs for your box. And finally, PIN at 15, when we celebrate our 20th anniversary, it will be a time for us to reflect not just on our impact, but also in terms of the impact that we would have been able to create as a community, an opportunity to empower other civil society organizations, other institutions to not just come into their own, to not just become uh, institutions that are sustainable and on a journey to maximum impact, but as an organization, and I say this a lot in the office, that the reason why we do some things that we are not told to do or even required to do is because we're building a 100-year institution and there are so many hard things that we need to do. And we'll continue to do the hard things, we'll continue to do the tough things uh, because we know it pays and it helps you know, all our stakeholders, ourselves, our team members, our board members, our partners, and everyone. Paradigm Initiative is about connecting people to opportunities and of course, making sure that the policy environment is right. And we will continue to do that, not just in the countries where we operate, not just in the countries we currently have impact, but across the entire Global South. For 15 years, Paradigm Initiative has blazed a trail, teaching the underserved youth of Africa important skills they need to survive in an age where digital is everything. In 15 years, Paradigm Initiative has evolved from a simple idea to a revolution that has changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of African youths with their skill acquisition programs and digital rights and inclusion initiatives.